episode five. Our guest, uh, an all-time NBA legend, um, probably the hardest guy I've, I've ever had to guard in my career, uh, Dwayne, Dwayne Wade. D-Wade, thanks for joining us, man. Man, of course, Dave. Thanks for having me in. I've been listening to you guys from afar, so it's definitely cool to now part. We've seen you shout us out. Yeah, man. I, I, I appreciate good content, you know? I love it. You guys it. like great content. <laughs> I'll say this. It's your shout outs are the only shout outs JJ has been excited about. <laughs> every time, every time he's hyped, he sends it to me. I appreciate that, man. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the internal brotherhood thing that we share. You know, you compete against guys so much. You don't get a chance to really talk to and get to know everybody. But, you know, from afar, when you see people, you know, are fans of yours or appreciate you in any way, it feels good, you know? It does. It does. I, I, I will admit to that, though. I will... Uh... You've, you've shouted out the show twice on Twitter and I screenshotted it and sent it to Tommy and I and our other friends group chat like immediately. I'm like, yo, I think I think D Way is actually listening to the show. <laughs> like, he doesn't just know there is a show. He's listening to the show. No, I did. I listened to uh, Rex. Uh, I listened to Rex Chapman. I also listened to Pat Bev. Um, and I love Rex. He's incredible from, you know, his journey, his story and what, and how he's kind of, you know, made his brand now and Pat Bell from the shy, you know, everything about him is I love. So, uh, yeah, I, I started listening, man. Um, uh, let's take the last like five months out of the equation. This is, this is something that I think about a lot is like, what is, what is the first year of retirement look like for me? We, you played, for 16 years, I'm in my 14th year. You grind and you grind and you grind, and that comes to a stop. So, pre, let's say pre March, how were you enjoying being a retired NBA player? <laughs> One of the best feelings I've ever had, <laughs> and it all and it all comes from just walking away from the game, just feeling feeling like I, I didn't leave anything on the table. You know, I felt like from my actual game, I gave everything. Literally, gave my entire body to the game. Um, I feel like I did everything in my power as a teammate to make sure that, you know, our team could be successful and the organization could be successful. Um, I felt individually I accomplished everything me more than I thought I would accomplish when I started playing basketball and once I got drafted. So I walked away from the game like, okay, that chapter, thank God that chapter is now behind me. The, the stress and the pressures of trying to live up to the expectations of being Dwayne Wade, uh, when you're 30 something years old and you can't live up to that no more, it, it can become a thing, you know, a real thing where I knew therapy was going to be in my future and just being honest. And um, so I, I but I definitely walked away from the game, man, head up high, chest poked out and, and thankful that I was able to to walk away and be able to wave my, my hand to everybody and, and thank the fans and thank my um, you know, all, all the players I played against for, you know, just for the experiences, man. And it was great. So you actually did struggle with that burden your last few years of I'm still D Wade, but my body is getting older. It can't quite do the things it used to be able to do. To to be to be fair to you, you still were a very good NBA player your last few years. And <laughs> you ended with a triple double in your very last game. But but yeah. that that was an internal struggle, it sounds like. It was, man. I mean, I think <clears throat> Everybody doesn't have. Let's just let's use LeBron, right? It, that that right there is a special breed, right? Everyone cannot go from where he went to like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like his his fall will never. We probably would never see a real big fall from you know what we came to to love about him, right? He's he's blessed with that. You know, for me, you know, I got up to a level, and that level was what everybody seen me at. It's like once I reach that level, it's like, okay, this is who he is. And then once you cannot get there anymore, now not only do you know people see it, but you start to feel it and you and it starts to frustrate you. And you my body breaking down over the years, over the years, and I'm still my name hasn't changed. You know, everything, all the promotion about who I am hasn't changed. Um, and you don't want it to change neither, but that burden becomes a heavy burden where you carry the frustrations and the stress of not being as good as you uh, or as great as you once were, um, you know, on certain nights. And when you have those nights, it definitely feel good, but they come far, far, far in between. <laughs> yeah. I, our mutual friend CP is another great example where he somehow figured out a way at his age as a small point guard to not have a significant drop-off. 
And he's talked about changing his diet, changing his training habits. Um, but what he's doing right now with the Thunder is absolutely remarkable. That's crazy. So, you know, CP is a great friend of mine. And we was we had a conversation via voice note. I'm, I'm big into voice notes now. It's like that in between, like, I ain't got to call you and I don't want to text all this. So I voice note a lot. And I, I, we were going back and forth and I was just telling CP, man, it is great to see you out there moving the way you're moving. And I don't think a lot of people really understand what, you know, how big that is. I watched CP the last two years and it wasn't the Chris Paul that I, that we all, uh, that you play with in, in LA with the Clippers, right? And I know the pain that CP was dealing with internally. And, you know, we don't go out and, and talk about everything we're dealing with. So CP started working out with, um, started working with DVC, uh, my, the trainer that I had in Miami that, that I feel like re- you know, Drew, like saved my career um, in Miami and, and allowed me to play another four years in uh, David Alexander. And they changed the way his body has functioned the last few years. And um, obviously the eating has a big part of that. They changed the way he, he's, he's eating um, and everything. And, and he just said, man, it just feels good to be healthy and be able to do the things that, you know, I've always wanted to do. It sucks when you're on the court, Jay, and you like, okay, this is what this is my moves and you can't get to your moves you can't get to your spot you can't raise up and shoot over anybody you can't blow past anybody like that stuff sucks so to be able to to see cp out there moving the way he's moving uh for me man i'm just i'm so happy for him because i know the journey yeah Dwayne, what do you think the biggest shift in the league has been since since 03 since you, since you came in the biggest shift um well obviously the rule change uh, when I first came in, it was still hand checking going on. <laughs> so you got those older veterans like Gary Payton, them, you know, they guiding you <laughs> around yeah. court with their strong hands. And once the NBA decided that, listen, OK, it's the defense is great, but we need we need a little bit more in, uh, entertainment, you know, entertainment. We need a little bit more excitement. And they started changing the rules and it benefited guys like myself because could nobody put their hands on me anymore. But you've seen it over and over time where the points are just going up because and no one wants to see drag out defense, you know, uh, every night. You know, you want to see up and down, guys jumping to the moon, guys shooting from half court. You want to see that. So just the way that the rules have changed, um, the talent has definitely um, is, is different because guys are working on different things now because the game is different. The rules are different. Um, so they're working on things that we didn't necessarily work on. Um, so you see amazing talent in the NBA. Uh, so you just I've been a part of watching the game evolve and change like while I was in the middle of it a couple times. I'm like, oh, man, the game has changed again. <laughs> like it changed like <laughs> yeah. four times in my career. So, uh, yeah, I feel like it changed with this, the Phoenix Suns uh, and their seven seconds or less. And actually, I was just talking. I was out at the pool a second ago with Scott Brooks. Their pace, if you were to put their pace at that seven seconds or less in today's NBA, it would be one of the lowest paces in the league, but it was revolutionary at the time. And that's it, crazy. It's crazy. That's crazy. I mean, they got like, they didn't play defense. It was like, get the layup, <laughs> get it out, go. You know, yes. it's crazy that the, I heard that. I heard that towards the end of my career, too. And I was like, no way, because with the pace that they played, the style they played was so fun and to, to watch, not to play against, but to watch. Um, so, yeah, man, you, you we like when I, I knew it was over for me, when these young guys came in, and they were running so fast. I mean, I think we was playing against Sacramento one game, and I think um, De'Aaron Fox and Buddy, they were running – they were getting a shot up in, like, three seconds. And I was like, I can't even, like, get back in three seconds, not let alone you get a shot up in three seconds. So, and I, I looked at Coach, I almost said, take me out, but my ego wouldn't let me. <laughs> I knew it was time. I was like, no, it's time. These guys are too fast. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you miss the most about being an active player? You know what? Uh, the performance. I miss performing. You know, I mean, like we're we're at, at the end of the day, basketball, you're entertainers. I miss the ability to raise 20,000 people up that's in that arena and it, having a ball in my hand and controlling someone's night. Like if I miss this shot, some people are going to be happy. Some people are going to be angry. Uh, so I, I miss the ability to, to perform uh, on the court, but also miss the things that you know you're going to miss. I miss my teammates. I miss the locker rooms. I miss the laughter, the jokes and, you know, all the things that you, you miss that everyone tells you that you're going to miss when you walk away from the game. Uh, I miss that camaraderie. That's why for me, it's actually been cool to kind of work for TNT 
because I'm able to be around, you know, Shaq and, and Charles at times and Kenny and, you know, Adam and, and Candace. And you, you get that team vibe. You get that camaraderie before we go on air. And it's kind of like, okay, this, this gives me a little bit, you know what I mean, of like what I missed. Would you, would you have missed not playing in front of the fans if you had to play in the bubble? I mean, this, this is, you just said you, you liked performing in front of people. Obviously there's people watching on TV. I I do get the sense from having played five games now that it's something we're all missing a little bit. We get the camaraderie, you get the clips of the benches going nuts when guys are, are are going on a hot streak or, or whatever, but there's, there's something about that relationship in person with fans that just, you can't really replicate that high anywhere else. Yeah, you're 100 percent correct, man. I, I I always said this: if I if we got paid for being practice players, I would have been one of the least paid players to ever play this game. That that was actually talented, <laughs> um, because there's something about the performance for me. Like I, I you know I, I will work hard in practice, but I was never great in practice. Right? I was a pretty good practice player, and some days I turn it on, and for me, it looks like. It some some games that you watch, some games, it looks like, oh, that looks like how our practices were, right? And it's like you can't get up to go against certain guys. Is it something about like seeing, oh, okay, Denzel's here. Oh, okay, Spike's here. Oh, okay. Like it's certain people that you'd be like, oh, I'm putting on the show tonight. Or you look in a crowd on the road and it's that one kid that got your jersey on way, way at the top. you like, I'm going to put on the show tonight for him. Like all these things that kind of in, in a long season, you look for these small things when it comes to fans that get you – you know, going or someone says something to get you going uh, that you don't have. So I would have been terrible in the bubble. Did you have a favorite road arena to just go in and light up? Madison Square Garden. It's everybody's. And, <laughs> is that it's everyone's answer? Everybody. Adds. I mean, like outside of even basketball, Jay, I've asked like uh, artists, like entertainers, like where's the favorite, your favorite place to perform? They like, man, Madison Square Garden. It, it's just, it's just, it's something about it, right? It's like when you walk in, it's just that, it's that aura when you walk in and you know that greats have performed here and they've done amazing things. And if you want to be a part of that, it's, you got to do the same thing. Is there any, was there any Chicago for you considering what you guys did to them in the playoffs over and over again? You know, it wasn't the same. It, it, it was always weird playing back in Chicago. It, it never got comfortable. I mean, I've had some great games there, some cool moments, but I grew up like my vision of becoming an NBA player, you know, came from like the Chicago Bulls. So every time I had to play them, it was just it felt weird. <laughs> I can't lie. Yeah. It just felt weird, especially back in Chicago. I'm watching all my family there and I know they all got Bulls shirts and hats and they ain't wearing none of them to the game. They got the heat stuff on. It's not real. It was fake. So I, I don't know, man. I just I, I definitely enjoyed my one year playing there from the sense of like just living that childhood dream out, you know, being a kid and you know, hearing that starting lineup. And I always wanted to hear from Chicago, Illinois, you know, and I got a chance to do that. So I, I enjoyed that more than playing against the Bulls in Chicago my entire career. To, to that point, how weird was it the first time you played the Miami Heat? Because I can remember the first time, I was in Orlando seven years. I remember the first time I played the Magic and the emotions I was going through. The first time I played the Clippers. This earlier this year, going back to Philly for the first time. Um, yeah. Didn't have those feelings when I played the Bucks because I was only there for, for a very short you period of time. Bucks? We played you on the playoffs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, right. you guys swept us in the playoffs. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. Um, no, but how 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 odd was that? That first time going against the Heat. Yeah, I, it was terrible. Like. We had a back-to-back, too, right? We come from Atlanta. We get in Miami. I don't have a lot of time to do nothing but just go to my house. And I, and once I get off the bus, I'm trying to, like, okay, it's a regular game. It's a regular game. I get off the bus, and immediately I knew it wasn't a regular game. Like, it was just a, it was crazy. And I walked to the, to the visitor's locker room. I've never been in the visitor's locker room, like, unless it was, like, a concert, but it looked way different. So you never really got a chance to experience it. And everything was just weird. Like even that my shoes didn't fit right that day. Like nothing felt good that day. And I go out there and I'm seeing all these familiar faces that has been rooting for me and they still rooting for me, but it's just, it's just weird because I'm on the opposite side of the court. Uh, I couldn't wait to get that game over with. I, I definitely wanted to get a win. I told my team, I said, listen, don't worry about feeding me the ball all game and trying to make this a, the way he comes back and scores 30 plus. Like, let's just get a win and get out of here. Because this is the this is the one of the weirdest feelings I've ever had. 
When you retired, did you feel like you turned off your competitive edge for a little bit? Or is it still there? And if it is, how are you sort of filling that or scratching that competitive itch, I should say? Mm, great question. Great question. I, I don't know. I just shifted, right? Like, like when it came to like, when I first retired, when it came to training and stuff, Jay, I was like, I ain't training like I used to. I'm done. <laughs> unless it's unless it's for a Gatorade commercial. Right. Let's put commercial. <laughs> <that I'm in. laughs> but like I turned off the basketball competitiveness that I've had, and but it just shifted it into something else. So um, I shifted into my business life and, um, and, and, and I need, cause I needed to like the one thing that I was a little nervous about when I, when I was going to walk away from the game and I had a lot of things going on and you know, nothing's going to replace basketball, no matter what you do. Like Charles Barkley says a lot, like, you know, nothing's going to be better than being Dwayne Wade playing for the Miami Heat, nothing. But like, I knew that I wanted to, you know, to get out and, and I knew I was moving to LA. I knew that business was a big part of my future. And I knew that I was starting all the way over though. I wasn't coming in the top dog. I was coming in to learn everything new. And so it was just that that kind of got me out of bed every day. So I just kind of put shifted my competitiveness into that and tried to like dive into like, okay, started making these things up in my mind <laughs> to, you know, to try to become better on this side. You've had one of the most exemplary off the court uh, portfolio building, brand building of any modern athlete. I mean, you're up there with anybody. Um, but there's a big difference, at least I feel like, in being active NBA versus retired NBA. So as yeah. you were making and you are making this transition, has there been moments where you're like, man, I, I kind of got to humble myself. Like I'm, I'm not the best at this specific thing and i've got to sort of learn from the ground up every day every day you know it's like i, I learn a lot from my wife now you know i have my own production company and i'm really uh i have a deal with one media and i'm heavily into that and it's so much i don't know it's so much i have to learn it's so much reading i have to do like <laughs> first of all like it's so much reading i have to do and i have to be accountable for this you know what i mean to come back and give notes and uh, it, it's, it's, it's way different, you know, and I, and I have like 12 jobs. I swear I do, but 100% it's, it's all about, and I've always felt that, you know, I've had moments where, you know, I was a little cocky, but I've always felt like deep down inside, I've been a humble person, um, my entire life. And so coming into this and humbling myself, wasn't the issue. It was just knowing that I had to kind of start all over. It's like being a rookie all over again. And that feeling of, you know, just a little uneasy and a little uncomfortable and, you know, not knowing when to, when to speak up and when not to, and just all these different things when it comes to sitting in boardrooms and sitting across from people who have been doing this for 30 or 40 years, whatever industry I'm getting into, these people have been doing this. So uh, you just feel a little unsure of yourself and that's uncomfortable. Tommy, have you had, uh, have you had D Wade seller wine yet? I have not. I need to. I knew this was going to come up yeah. though. Uh, Dwayne, somebody, somebody either from your team or somebody from D Wade seller sent me two bottles of your white blend down here to the bubble. Okay. Have you first of all, have you read the article from this week, the Baxter Holmes article about the uh the wine consumption going on in the bubble? I haven't read it. Actually, I was on a wine call yesterday and they mentioned it. And I, yeah. I knew it was something out there, but I, I have not. But uh it how they mentioned <laughs> it was because, you know, when I first started my wine company, it was like, okay, we're not, we can't promote this. Like NBA players don't drink wine like that, where it's, it's public. So we gotta kind of do this in China. And they kind of mentioned it. So no, I haven't read it yet though. When did you when did you see the shift in wine consumption in the NBA? Well, I, I don't I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't wanna say that. It, the story that goes, how the story goes, because we all in our eras and our generation, we all feel like we started something, right? It's like, oh, we started fashion. No, no, we didn't. No, it was there before. As guys were, you know, Walt Clay, well, uh, Clive Frazier was dressing fashion way before. We, Dennis Rodman was doing this way before. It's like, so we think that we did, we, we started stuff. But uh, for me, when it became real was really with my friends, with, with Melo and CP, uh, CP and LeBron and myself and, you know, kind of all of us getting into that passion together um, and making it a cool thing, you know, like traveling the world and posting photos and talking about it and sharing it, you know, and sharing it with other people, et cetera. So that's for me, that's when it became real. But I'm sure it was already going on, you know, amongst players. 
it just didn't become public until certain guys did a few interviews about it. And I'm sure I was one of those guys that did an interview about it uh, around the time I was starting my wine company. Don't you think, though, you could make the argument because, you know, like the banana boat, these are like the these are the best players in the league on different teams. And, you know, so to that point, I'm sure guys have been drinking wine since the beginning of the NBA, but there was never necessarily it's it's one thing for like one team to have a bunch of teammates that are drinking it together. It's another thing to have four of the five best players in the league all hang out and doing it. So there is an argument to be made that you guys did sort of like cement that shift a little bit. I know you're being humble I mean, now. I'm, but I'm rolling with that there. You said it. I yeah. I'm, I'm planting it. I'm planting it. You, you take the credit. <laughs> I'm good. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> did, you, did you have like an aha moment with wine? Because I, I, I remember early in your career, I don't think, I don't think you really – drank a lot off the you know you know even during the off season yeah i remember you telling me that back in 2006 when we were doing usa national stuff yeah um so so when was that when was that shift when was that moment where you're like oh i, I understand what good wine is now you know what it just kind of it just kind of happened I, I, the, as the story goes so playing with your vets are very important in everything you do right so alonzo morning was was on me about drinking wine and i was like so i don't want to like i don't i don't want to drink it so he made me drink this bottle of flowers and to start off with red wine first of all is the worst decision to make if you're coming from kool-aid like i was drinking lemonade and kool-aid and so i decided so i drank some of this flowers wine uh, it was a pinot noir and it was disgusting it was the worst thing i ever tried so then you know my my business manager lisa joseph metellus who um, has been with me from the beginning. She was like, okay, let's just try you on like Riesling because it's sweeter, you know, it's white, it's cold, like maybe you'll like it. And just like over the course of time, you know, going to dinners, going to Prime 112, like hanging out in Miami, you just, you know, you, you, you started getting older. I was 27, 28 around this time. And you just, you, you start, it started eventually coming apart of, you know what, let me order that. Let me order that. Let me, so I just kind of got into it slowly. And eventually I just, I grew the taste for it. My palate started growing and I started to enjoy, you know, kind of how I felt drinking wine. It was like, you know, but it's, it, it's a very slow process for me. It wasn't, I didn't go all in at first. And then a few years uh, after, you know, being exposed to wine, I had a business opportunity um, to get into the wine space. And that kind of changed everything to me because, you know, when I put my business head on, I think about the future. How is this going to matter years from now? And I was actually thinking about, you know what, when I retire one day, this could actually be a cool industry to be a part of. And it just started before I retired. But that was my mindset. I think any consumption of alcohol is often a uh, an acquired taste. You know, Fact. nobody Fact. nobody at 16 or 17 years old and I'm not condoning underage drinking but for a kid <laughs> in high school who who drinks his first beer it's not a pleasant taste it's an acquired <laughs> taste I, I can remember in my own wine journey um when I when I graduated from Duke I hosted a little party for like my family in my in my one bedroom apartment and I was like I should get some wine because my older sisters drink wine and I went to the store and I got red wine and white wine. I didn't know that there were different grapes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And now and now I've done like a three year deep dive on Burgundy and I can name all the Grand Cru's and, and tell you all there is to know about uh, different soil types. It's uh, it's a it's a fucking rabbit hole if there ever is See, one. <laughs> I would love that. Like I would love to like I would love to drink wine with you because you're gonna educate me in a way that like it's like I've drunk I've drank so much great wine, but a lot of it a lot of the names don't stick. Like it'd be like, What did you drink last night? I'd be like, I don't know. It had like five names on a bottle. You know, like a lot of the names don't stick, but I take photos of everything I drink and I, you know, I obviously I know where they come from, but I would love to sit with someone that really, really like once they drink something, they go so deep into it. They're like specialists at it. And I feel like you would be one of those people. JJ, you are uniquely good at it because the, the names are complicated. Complicated. They're really complicated. They're not, it is not for a novice. You could drink a lot of wine and not remember any of the names. I, listen, especially when you're drinking, how do you remember the names? When you <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a valid point. It's a valid point. <laughs> so you, you, but I, but I fell in love with French wine. So I, you know, I, I, I get it. Like Burgundy and, you know, Bordeaux, all this. Oh my God. It's, it's another level. It's like, it messed my life up once I started getting that kind of wine. Did you ever bring a wine suitcase on the road? Yes, yes, yes. I have, I have plenty. Um, I, I actually, 
I, I did one. So I, I had this um, deal with away luggage. And I actually, I think CP, uh, when he got to the bubble, he, he put a photo out um, where he took, I, I, um, I created a, a luggage with wine where you can put wine in there. And that was a part of my, my deal because I was so into wine. So, uh, yeah, I was the guy that, you know, it, I, I remember we were on the road. I was in Cleveland one night and <clears throat> we were sitting out outside the hotel and, you know, enjoying drinks. And they closed it. They was like, hey, you guys got to go in. We can't serve you guys drinks anymore. And, you know, I'm with Brian and everybody. And, we, and, you know, guys like what? They was like, yeah, y'all can sit in the lobby, but y'all can't have no more drinks. I was like, so what if we bring our own drinks? Can we drink? They was like, yeah. I was like, hey. I got about 12 bottles upstairs of wine, <laughs> you know, let's go get that. And we sat in the lobby and drunk those 12 bottles of wine. So I, I definitely travel with my wine a lot. That's great. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, Dwayne, do you remember the very, you probably don't, I do, but do you remember the very first time that you and I played against each other? I mean, I think I do, but I don't have like a date, but I, I mean, I know you were okay. in Orlando. <laughs> you're you're wrong you're wrong on this oh Jul- i was you in orlando july 1999 we were in orlando you were playing for the illinois warriors i was playing for boo williams really at aau nationals we played in the final four you guys beat us um your team was darius miles yeah tj cummings brett melton matt loddick a lot of, and the yeah. fifth the fifth guy on the team, this is crazy. The fifth guy on the team was Dwayne Wade. And you weren't even ranked in the top 100. No. Over the, I, <laughs> we played you there. Then we saw you guys later on at a different tournament. I can't remember where it was. But I remember, wow. I remember talking with my teammates. And we would always be like, yo, are we crazy? But is, is that Wade guy the best player on that team? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wild to think that. You were essentially unranked you were not a top 100 player no. you were um not heavily recruited you end up no. going to marquette on a prop 48 you sit out a year you play two years at marquette you get drafted as a lottery pick within two years you're an all-star 2006 your nba finals mvp so in the course of six years you went from unranked high school player to nba finals mvp and by the way you had the highest player efficiency, efficiency rating in a, in a modern NBA Finals in that Finals against Dallas. How, how does that transformation happen that quickly? Listen, the way you just put that, first of all, was pretty darn impressive. I've never really thought about it <laughs> in that way. I'm about to tell my son to come and listen to it. <laughs> um, but first of all, let me go back to that. I remember I re- we went to the Finals in Orlando. I remember the tournament. We lost in the Finals. Um, but I definitely remember that tournament. I'm sorry I did not. I don't know. No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, truthfully, but, I, truthfully, uh, I went by Jonathan back then, so okay. I wasn't listed <laughs> as JJ on the on the on the <laughs> roster. <laughs> okay, so just Jonathan. All right. Um, but you know what, man? It was it's crazy. So that was my first year playing AAU basketball. So I, I never really, I never played AAU basketball. I went to a small high school that wasn't even known for basketball. It was known for football. And partly my fault because I wanted to follow my brother, my older brother footsteps who went there. My dad wanted me to go to Whitney Young, which Q Rich, you know, went to Whitney Young and eventually my college teammate Cordell Henry and so forth and so on. But I wanted to follow my brother. So no coaches came out. <laughs> we didn't like, you know, we didn't get nobody coming out watching us. And and I had and I also, too, I was a I developed late. Like my athleticism came late. I didn't grow into my junior high school. I went from five, seven to six, two. Um, in one in one summer. So everything kind of happened late for me. Um, but I felt like my game just it, it just it caught up like when I really felt like I was getting good really was like in the final four. It was weird. It was like in the final four. I felt like I am quicker than I've ever been. I am more athletic than I ever been. Uh, this is great. <laughs> and then I got to the NBA and it just kept going and going and going. So uh, for me, man, I, and I always just credit it to hard work. Like I wasn't ranked, I wasn't known, and and that pushed me to get in the gym. And because I wanted, I wanted it, and I wanted to to get my family. I wanted to bring my family alone. I wanted to change the the course and the direction of, you know, how the Wade family has been living. You know, just honestly, you know, for as long as as, as I know down the line. So I wanted to, I wanted to be that one, and I asked my God to to give me those abilities. And he did. So I wasn't, once I knew I had a special talent, the hard work was the next thing that I had to really buy into. 
and I did. And I just I just kept going, put my head down and I just worked. And I, once I came up for air, um, I was a three time champion and I was retiring from the NBA when, once I really came up for air. So it was just a cool journey, man. When did you have a sense about the 03 draft that it was going to sort of be what it turned into? Uh, so the crazy thing about the 03 draft, obviously, we knew LeBron was going one, right? Yeah. And Darko comes out of nowhere around that time. You know, we we didn't know anything about Darko. So automatically, we're like, okay, Carmelo's going to. We know that. Um, so those were the top two players in our draft until Darko came in. And then from there, uh, Chris Bosh and I had the same agent, uh, agent uh, Henry Thomas, uh, rest in peace. And I knew Chris Bosh was going to go forth to Toronto for some reason. I just felt like, okay, he's going forth. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, well, I'm, proje- I'm projected to go anywhere from fourth to like 20. So anywhere between there, here we go. And I was actually eyeing um, Orlando Magics because Doc Rivers, who was a former Marquette Golden Eagle, or Warrior probably at the time when he played, uh, he told me, he said, listen, if you're there, I'm taking you. Like, you know what I mean? And I, so I felt very confident that Doc Rivers was going to draft me. What pick did they have? I think they had the 15th pick. They had the 15th pick that year. And then T-Mac was still there. Um, so I'm sitting there in the draft room, and I'm like, okay. In my mind, I'm like, the draft starts at the fifth pick. You know, the first four I already knew. So I'm like, here we go. Who's going five? And then next thing you know, my agent comes over, and he says, hey, the Heat about to take you at five. And I'm just like, what? Like, it was mind-boggling to me that I was about to go to fifth pick in the draft. Like, I literally was like, okay, I'll be 15. <laughs> <laughs> So it, it just happened, man. And like, I just, it was like a, a out of body experience. I remember just going numb. I had Zaire, who's now 18 years old. I had him on my lap at the time. And uh, it was a cool experience because I didn't expect anything. I knew I got invited to the green room so that I knew that teams liked me, but I really didn't have a lot of information. You know, really, I was just there because I was invited. And I felt that maybe Doc would grab me. You know, maybe he won't let me stay in this green room all day. <laughs> that was it. Did you work out for the Heat? Prior to the draft, I did. okay. I did. So, so it, Riley, it Riley like, loved you. It wasn't an impressive workout. It wasn't like an impressive workout. Like I didn't walk away from that. Like, yeah, I just, I just did that. Like you understand, like Jay, I, I worked out for like thirteen teams, and in a, like a certain amount of days. You know, it was a, it was like 15, 16 days of like working out. So I had back to back to back workouts. Some I was great in. Some I was terrible in. When we're frying commercial and I'm we're getting delayed at the airport, you're getting in at three in the morning, you up early to work out. So I didn't work out great at every place I went. You know, I thought actually I thought that if one team was going to draft me high, it was going to be the Chicago Bulls. They had the seventh pick at the time. I worked out for the Bulls twice. I was a hometown kid. Uh, unfortunately, I had just lost uh, Jay Will, uh, who had an amazing rookie season. And I was like, you know what? If it's any team outside of Doc Rivers at Orlando at 15 who would pick me, it would be Chicago. So I'm sitting there like, okay, 7 to 15 and one of those picks. And never thought that Pat Riley, Pat Riley didn't give me any indication that he was going to draft me. Um, he didn't give anybody else an indication that he was going to draft me. So I had no idea. I think, I think this is a big what if for Bulls fans. Because I think, Kirk, they picked Heinrich, who was a very solid pro for a long time. Yeah. But I think they thought they were going to get you too. And that's a huge what if for that franchise is like if you have the if there, if you're there instead of Miami, that's a I mean, who knows what could have happened, but like Man. it's it's you in that situation would have been it would have been different. I'm glad I didn't get drafted there, though. I'm going to keep it real with you. I, I don't know if I would have been able to. You know, I come from nothing, literally nothing. And getting drafted in Chicago with all my family there. That would have been too. That would have been tough for me, and um, and I didn't have the the people in my life at that time that could have helped shield me from that. And I'm a nice guy. I would have been broke. <laughs> yeah, I, I would have yeah. been broke, man. I wouldn't have performed the right way. So, listen, they lucked out and not got me at that time because I, I wasn't ready to be drafted in 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 Chicago, coming from where I came from. Well, well I was going to ask you, as much as it was great for the Heat organization to draft you. How great was it for you to be drafted by the Heat organization and to yeah. be a part of that culture and to play for Riley and to play for Spo and to to build a legacy there? It was it was very important. But first of all, let me not forget Stan Van Gundy. Oh yeah, we I I got to throw that in there too. Yeah, I got to yeah, throw Stan I mean, in he there. He wasn't there long. They got Stan had to go over there to where you were at. But uh, Stan actually was very big in my development because Stan allowed me to like go. Eventually, once I went to him, like, coach, come on, man, let, let me do something. 
Um, but it was because the Miami Heat has, and you guys have heard this, you've heard about the Heat culture. And it's real. Like, I'm sure they're in the bubble practicing more than anybody. <laughs> I'm sure they're getting out of it. And, you know, they, it, but it, what it, what it, when I came into Miami, you got to understand, it's South Beach, right? Everybody think of Miami, you think of South Beach. Pat Riley wasn't playing those games. He wasn't allowing us to be, you know, just into the streets. He made sure that we, you know, that we had responsibilities uh, that we had to be responsible for at the arena at uh, at all times, it felt like. And I needed that. I needed that structure because I, I come from a broken family. You know, my mom and dad wasn't together. My mom was in jail when I, when, I, when I was young and, you know, just getting her life back and my dad. So the journey of my family, if I go, if I don't go to an organization like Miami, I don't know where, you know, where I would be, you know, for sure. So it was the best thing that happened to me that, I, that Pat Riley was there and that he, that he that he had the culture that he had and, and that I had Stan Van Gundy as my first coach and not Pat Riley as my first coach because Stan let me go. You know, Stan let me make mistakes. And once Stan saw my strength as a pick and roll player, Stan just let me just be me. And I thank him all the time for that because I would not be sitting here as accomplished as I was if it wasn't for my first coach in the NBA, Stan. Did you see the Stan departure coming? Because you guys were coming off a 59-win season – you make it to game seven of the Eastern Conference Finals and lose to the Pistons the prior year. And then at the beginning of the season, you get off to a slow start. And I don't even remember how many games it was in. It was like 11 games, 10 games. It wasn't a lot. Like, and Stan's it gone. Was like 20 some games. Okay. In. Yeah, it was 20. So I had no, JJ, no. I wasn't like, they wouldn't get, like at that time, I wasn't the guy they was calling up in the <laughs> office telling me the moves that was going to go on, possibly. Yeah. Um, you know, Stan, our first year, we go to the playoffs. We win, I think we go 42 and 40. You know, we take a team that was seven and we was like 17 and like, I don't know, 34 at one time. Like we had a terrible record at one time and we turned that around and, be, and went to the playoffs 42 and 40 our first year, went to the second round, lost in game six. Then we come back the next year, we, we win 50 some games and we go to game seven of the East Conference Finals. So you think that this is just about to keep building. And Shaq missed 10, I think Shaq missed like 10 games that season. And Shaq's first game back, we were playing with Washington. We, we end up winning the game. I think at this point now, we 11 and 10. And I'm, I'm just in the training room, getting my work on my body. And Shaq come in and he said, yo, come in the locker room. And I'm like, what? He was like, Stan about to get fired. And I was like, excuse me? He's like, Stan about to get fired. And I was like, I don't understand it because you got to think about it. When I, when I first got to Miami, Pat Riley was the coach. Pat Riley coached us through training camp through preseason and before the first game on open night, Pat Riley stepped down and then Stan became the coach. And so now I got my, like, I got my foot and I know everything. And now Stan is leaving and Pat's coming back. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> like, I'm confused. Like what is going on around here? Uh, but Pat came in and, and it was actually the coach that we needed. Just the, the respect that he had, his aura uh, for that veteran team. You know, we had Jay Will, we had Gary Payton, we had James Posey and Antoine Walker and Zoe Shaq. Like we had a veteran group and Pat came in and it was a different respect that Pat had as, you know, everything he's done. And Stan was what, a two-year coach at the time. So uh, we needed that. The summer of 2006, uh, there was a training camp for USA basketball. You guys were getting ready to go play in the world championships. It was Coach K's first year playing USA basketball. It's about two weeks after you had won finals MVP. Yeah. And I had, I had just graduated college and I had just got drafted and they had invited me and Adam Morrison there as like the college kids. <clears throat> Basically the new version, the, the old version of what is now the select team. They just invited us to, to camp. We got to be part of the roster for three years. And I was completely overwhelmed. I mean, I'm looking at these guys like Kobe and you and Braun. Like I'm, I'm like out of my element. My back was hurt. I couldn't play. I remember very specifically though, leaving the hotel one day to go to the gym and I got on the bus and I watched you get on the bus and you kind of went to the back of the bus and you had like a swagger and everybody else kind of got on the bus and I started listening to the conversation and I was like, yo, like D Wade is the man. Like he, like you at that time, all of a sudden, like, and you were a young player still, but I was like, yo, like D Wade is the guy. Like he's the one who's, he's, he's, I hate to use this terminology, but he's the big dick in the room. Like that's basically what it was. 
I love it. I love it. <laughs> oh man, I, I I'll I'll never forget that. I'll never that is, forget that. Is, that. that is, but I listen. I didn't know I was. I just, I, you know what? I think Jay. I was just always comfortable in who I was. You know what I mean? I never tried to be anybody else. And whatever I was developing into it eventually came. But I was always comfortable in like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm doing now. And I think people seen that, and maybe sometimes they followed it or they respected it enough. Or they made fun of me or whatever, but like I didn't care, you know what I'm saying? So I, I definitely didn't feel that way. Uh, I didn't I didn't walk around with that kind of swag, but I just had my own swag. It was like whatever it was. But at that time, I was the man, though. I, you were the man. Like, I was the man. Be honest. Honest. I was coming out <laughs> finals MVP at 24. I, I was pretty a big deal at that time. So <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> are you are you are you guys doing a doc on the 08 team? Is that right? Yeah. So well, yeah, we we were in the in the before COVID, you know, yes. we, my, actually my last interview was like, right when COVID was like, is this real? Is it, you know, is this a thing? Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I was approached, um, you know, to do this documentary and I, you know, obviously I was a big part of the 018. And you know, what's crazy is when I, when I was approached to do it, I didn't want to do it alone. I actually wanted to do it with, you know, with someone else to kind of EP it. And they were saying, well, what do you want to do? I was like, you know what? I really would love to do a part of the doc. I would love to be able to sit down with Kobe. And because he was a big part of the 018. And I would love to be able to sit down with him and watch the game as a part of the documentary and kind of break down the game together. And they was like, cool, reach out to him if you can get him. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to wait. I'm not going to like, you know, I'm, I'm just going to wait. And, you know, obviously everything happened. Um, with Cove shortly after that. So we were in the process of filming the 08 doc and we kind of put it on pause for a second. Um, and we, But now it's like, we really want to make sure we tell the right story. So uh, we taking our time with it and make sure that we're going to tell the right story of the 08 team. We talk about Kobe a ton on this podcast and we just had Jason Tatum on. Kobe was his hero and Jason yeah. talked a little bit about what Kobe meant to him Will you just talk about your relationship with him and we all experienced different emotions on that day and in the weeks following and, and for some of us, I'm sure, uh, are still dealing with these emotions. Um, just talk a little bit about your relationship with him and, and what he meant. Man, it's crazy how just you can get emotional just by listening to, you know what I mean? Like my mind started going back to like to Kobe and, and man, I just got emotional that quick. Um, I think for me, man, when I got into the league, obviously Michael Jordan is my favorite player of all time. Um, I mean, but for me, when I got into the league, Kobe Bryant was the bar. You know, he was the greatest player in the game uh, to me uh, before I got in the league. But definitely when I got there, I mean, he was someone, I think he was 24 years old at the time when I got in. He had three NBA championships already. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when you want to talk about the swagger, oof. I mean, Kobe had it. But as a competitor, I knew that Kobe was the one for me that I had. If I wanted to be great that i had to get on the level of kobe bryant what however i did that i knew i had to get on his level or be respected by him in some way where he looked at me as equal so it pushed me and he pushed me and we didn't talk a lot early on but i feel like when we got to around 08 in the olympics is when we got close you know um and it, and it all it all started from training like, I think once you get around guys, you really see who, who they are and what they're built of because you're around them for, what, two, three months. And Kobe saw the, that my grind was very similar to his grind and that me and him did a lot of things where it was just me and him and it wasn't no one else around, you know. And so he started respecting me in a way that I already had respect for him in. Um, and then he just became like a big brother, you know, doing Olympics, you know, his knowledge of the game. Even though I was a great player, Kobe had knowledge of the game that I didn't have. And so he became a person that I would go to and just, hey, what should I do on this play? Hey, you know, how should I do this? And he kind of like, you know, he came to me and said, listen, when, I, when he heard that I wasn't starting um, and he knew that I'm sure he knew that, man, you know, I know D, this is tough for D-Wade not to be starting on this team. But he came to me right away and he eased my mind. He was like, listen, when you cut, when you get in the game and it's me and you on the floor, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick up 94 feet. I'm going to turn these guys. And once I turn them, you do what you do. You come in, <laughs> you know, and so I got so many steals and so many dunks and so much because of an unselfishness of a star in our lead to tell me, hey, I'm going to do these things. And all you got to do is, you know, so we just we just built a relationship. And that relationship went from uh, respect as competitors to now where I felt like he was a friend. 
and it eventually grew into just a brotherhood. And our relationship was something that I'm sure so many people have their own relationships with him. Um, but my relationship with him for me was special because this is a person who, you know, it was Michael Jordan, Allen Iverson and Kobe Bryant. These are my favorite players to ever play the game of basketball. And I had a relationship, a real relationship with one of those three for sure. Um, and, you know, he would reach out to me. Hey, man, how did you how do you how do you slice those pick and rolls like that? And I'm like, oh, my God, Kobe reaching out to me. <laughs> he like it was it was incredible to be able to have that relationship with him. And um, obviously, when I retired, you know, and, and I, you know, you, you just imagine like, OK, we're going to be those two old guys that, you know, that go to games and when the Heat play to L.A. and we're going to be on opposite sides. And, you know, it's just going to be that kind of thing. You just you see it coming. And, and not to have that, you know, not to be retired and have somebody that I can chase out the steal because he was doing amazing things after the game of basketball. Um, you know, you feel a little lost. And I said that when, when Kobe retired, I said, you know, what? when Kobe retired from basketball, I didn't have no one to chase anymore. I kind of actually I kind of lost a little bit of my of something in me when Kobe retired because it was like, well, who am I chasing now? You know, what I mean, who who is that big matchup for me? Because, yes, yeah, it's the younger guys coming up and you want to make sure. But I felt like Kobe was the only one that was that that was on the level that I was on. Uh, as as one of the top two guards. And even though I felt he was on a higher level than me, but I still was able to chase him. And I didn't have anybody to chase no more. So it was kind of like, uh, OK, all right, we're playing Sacramento on a Wednesday. All right, let me just go get this done. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just different. So, um, you know, I, I, I definitely uh, – I'm thankful that I was able to have a friendship and that, I, that we had a brotherhood. And we shared something intimate that a lot of people didn't know, you know, from our conversations that we had and the moments we had together. Um, I just – I feel thankful to, to – that I was worthy enough to have those with such an amazing human being. We're all obviously on our own individual paths in our, in our chase of greatness. And we have our inner circle that's pushing us. We have our own standard of greatness that we're excelling towards. But it's amazing to hear you talk about the importance of a measuring stick and how chasing after someone else improves your own greatness. It's actually really, it's remarkable. And I think for an entire generation of players, that's what Kobe did. He set a standard in, in the same way that LeBron set a standard, in the same way that for a lot of guys, you set a standard. It's part of every great player's legacy, I think, is the impact it has on the next generation. 100%. 100%. And you know what? What story came? Let me share this story with you, Jay. We were in the Olympics, right? And this is when I knew Kobe was a different monster, though. You hear about it. You hear about it. But you really, if you don't see it, you really, really don't know. And so we get into a city, uh, one of the cities very late. And immediately we all go to the gym. You know, all my guys is, you know, it's Mello, it's B, it's Bron, it's Kobe. Like we all go to the gym. We all get our work in. It's, re it's real late. And so after we get done getting our work in, me and my guys, we say, hey, like, let's meet for breakfast in the morning. Like, if you can't sleep, whoever first one wake up, hit us up. We're going to go eat. And so we do that. We probably get like three hours of sleep. You can't sleep much when you're traveling across the world, you know, like we were traveling. And we get probably get like three hours of sleep. And we, we wake up, we go down to where the food is. As we walking down, you know, slubbing with, with sleep in our eyes, Kobe Bryant is sitting there with ice on his knees already. Right. So we walk up to Kobe we like, Kobe, what, what's up? And he was like, oh, yeah, man, I just finished, uh, finished the workout and uh, I'm about to go do another one. And at that moment, I was like, wait, hold on. <laughs> we just worked out about three hours ago. You know what I mean? And like you've done another workout and you're about to go do another one. That's when I was like, OK, I got to get my stuff together. I got to get my shit together because this dude right here is on a whole different level uh, than even I'm on. And I'm supposed to be great. Right. So. That's the kind of person he was. And that's how he drove me. You know what I mean? Like this little stuff like that. I went back and said, okay, that means I got to work hard and I got to do more. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to share that little end of the story. He's a beast, man. That's great. I, I have a, a somewhat similar story, but in, in 07, when I got to do the training camp with you guys in Vegas, I got there on a Sunday. We were starting with practice on a Monday. So I get there Sunday afternoon. First thing I do is I hit up the Duke assistant coaches, Coach Collins, Coach Wojo, Coach Dawkins. I'm like, can y'all meet me at the gym? I just want to get some shots up. So I get to the gym and Johnny Dawkins look, looks like he lost his dog. Like I've never seen this guy look so just disheveled. 
I'm like, JD, what's JD? What's going on, man? <laughs> and he's like, man, fucking Kobe. This guy, this guy, this guy had me up at 6 a.m. this morning. He was in the gym for three hours, and he said he was doing the same move for three hours. He was, oh. it was, it was like a I'm pick and roll on the left side, jab, pull up right for three straight hours. The guy was just maniacal about his work it's 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 incredible it is man it's, it is incredible and he and that's not like people think those stories are like not real like those stories are real like i remember watching one game we got we were getting ready to play the lakers and i remember just you know i'm i'm a kobe fan i'm watching him warm up and he literally the entire warm up he did he did one shot he was in the mid post he just kept turning over the left shoulder over and over and over so I go into the game like, okay, he about to turn over the left shoulder over and over. And I couldn't stop it. But like he, I just watched him by himself. They just kept giving him ball for the entire 15, 20, however long you're out there. He kept doing the same thing over and over and over. And I was just amazed that. And then once the game started, I still couldn't stop it. And I knew what he was about to do over and over and over again, you know. <laughs> and that's just that's a part of his greatness, man. Did you guys, when you signed with Miami, did you guys expect the level of backlash and hate that came your way, especially initially? No. Did you expect that? Did you no. feel like it was going to be celebrated more than it was? Yes. We thought it, we, we, we thought it was going to be celebrated. I mean, you think about it. At that time, LeBron is beloved. I'm beloved. Chris Bosh. I mean, no one knows Chris Bosh like that, but he wasn't hated. <laughs> At the time, no one knew Chris from in Toronto like that, but he wasn't hated. Like he was a respected all-star in our game. Um, so no way that we did we think, you know, making a decision that we made to play together was gonna uh change course the way it did. And it was it was it was very surprising early on. It it, it took us a while to adjust to the hate, and I think we adjusted to it. The, the only way we know how was to get into the hate back, and wasn't it wasn't fun? That first year was not fun, even though we went to the finals and of course we lost. But it was just it was a bad year of basketball to be, you know. This is supposed to be the most joyous time. You've you're playing with some of your, your you know some of the best players in the world, one of your best friends, and in Miami the city's on fire, but we're having a we're just having a bad time just trying to like play basketball without joy and play it because of the and be driven by hate and uh we thought that that was the way we was like you know what we gonna show these mother you know and <laughs> we didn't dollar showed us at the end and it humbled us it, we needed we actually needed to be humble even though i'm mad because that was my second finals mvp and i'm mad that i don't got that on my record it wouldn't have changed anything but still i'm mad um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I th we, we thought we were going to be celebrated, man. We thought it was actually doing something that was pretty cool. Like we knew that the crowds was going to be crazy. We knew people was going to watch us, but we didn't think it was going to be the hatred that came with it. Um, not at all. When did it get fun? Like, when did you feel like it start, started to shift away from that? The, the next season. So one, once we came back out of the lockout, I think once we went to the lockout and we were playing those games everywhere, you know, going to North Carolina, Chris Paul had a game. Hey, come down to Miami, me and Brian got a game. And that was like back to the fun of basketball. We started having fun again because it was just it, it, it took you back to, you know, when you started playing, you know, just getting getting in. A, normally you would get in a car and go to a park and just hoop. Now, you know, we're getting into planes and we're going to other cities and we're hooping. But it, it brought back the fun of the game. So once we came back into that next season in 2011, uh, we had that swagger. We had that 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 joy back. And. That right there was fun. From that point on, we have fun. Why do why do you I want to go back to the to the decision not being celebrated? Why do you think the reaction to you guys joining deciding to join up in Miami was so different? We'll use another example. Let's use Danny Ainge trading for Ray Allen and Kevin Garnett and forming that big three in Boston, which by the way was only like three seasons prior to you guys making that decision to join up. Yeah. Why do you think the reaction was so different? Do you think it was because it was LeBron and he was sort of the, the best player in the game and he was supposed to do what Jordan did and not team up with other superstars to win? I definitely feel that was a big part of it. Um, <clears throat> like I want to throw it all on Brian, but... <laughs> I definitely feel that, you know, the fan, the fan base, you know, basketball fan base had an idea of how LeBron career ha was supposed to go. 
and it was supposed to go like Michael Jordan's career. He's supposed to stay in Cleveland his entire time and win six to seven rings, right? And he had other ideas for his career. And people at the time didn't understand why would he do that, right? They looked at it as a weak move. It's a weak move that he go team up with another all-star and another all-star. Um, so, yes, that, that was a big part of it. I think at the same time as well, they wasn't used to playing. At that time, it wasn't used to players having control. You know what I mean? Organizations made trades. That's what happened. You really, free agency before that was not really that sexy like that. You know, and even though it was some guys who, you know, like the, the I think it was Orlando Magic who had an opportunity to do some sexy stuff with, with Tim Duncan possibly and, and Grant Hill and T-Mac, like that would have been sexy, but that didn't happen. And it, it just wasn't something that was really the, the sexy thing to do. And at that moment when we made a decision as players and, and kind of put the control in the player's hand and change the dynamics of what people were used to, you were always going to get hate. You know, it's like Allen Iverson came in with with braids and tattoos and sleeves. And everybody's like, this is not how the best player in the game looks. They look like Michael Jordan. They don't have tattoos. They don't. And that wasn't Allen Iverson. So you get hate when you're the first ones to do it in the way we did it. Um, and so we understand it. You know, eventually we understood it because we we, we kind of opened up this this path for players to do it for a period of time. And it became the wave. Um, and I'm glad we did. I'm glad we took the hate. But I seen some real hatred out there, JJ. I'm talking about I see some ugliness and I, I from fans that I didn't know is that I didn't know existed. And I come from the inner city of Chicago and I didn't know some of this ugliness existed in the world. And when we talk about racism, when we talk about the things that people said to us, it was on display night after night. This is at the arena. This is not just people trolling on social media. You're saying this is at the arena. You're hearing stuff being said. Yeah, this is in our, this is at the arenas. This is in our everyday life, right? Of us traveling and going places. I mean, people, I mean, at that time, we had to have so much security around us because the hate was real, you know? And people would say some of the, the, the things that you would just look at them and say, like, you don't even know me. Like, how, how you speak of me in this? <laughs> how can you speak of me in this way? But I would never forget the Cleveland game. The first time we went back to Cleveland, I will never forget being in the locker room. And that was the time where I looked at LeBron. And I was like, hey, this guy's not, he's not normal. He's really not normal. I've always said it, but I really felt it. But the hatred that I heard in the locker room, I've never heard hate before. You know what I mean? Like you can hear someone say something, but if you ever heard the sound of hate, it is the most like uncomfortable thing to experience. And like I remember walking out of the tunnel. And it wasn't just booze and it wasn't just I hate you. It was the look on people's faces. It was the things that was coming out of their mouths and like how raged they were, like in anger that I said, I will never forget this moment in damn my life uh, about, you know, how someone can really hate you for making a basketball decision that you felt was best for yourself and your family is crazy to me. I don't want to I'm not going to plug myself here, <laughs> but please plug so yourself. I, I, no, I so I I went on. uh Taylor Rook's show on Bleacher Report. She did a whole series on race in America. Um, for some reason, she asked me to come on the show. And one of the things that I said on the show, and one of the things that I said on my podcast with Yahoo back in 2016, when Kevin Durant made his decision, is that the, the reaction to LeBron leaving and Kevin leaving is because there is a group of sports fans that are and will always be uncomfortable with powerful black men making decisions for themselves, uh, taking empowerment and taking control of their careers. Now, I, of course, the the you know the blogs or whatever said that I said that it was racist. I, I, I'm not going to go that far, but what I will say is I will stand by those words. I think, of course, an element of Kevin getting backlash was because he went and joined the team that just beat him in the conference finals. Of course, part of the backlash with LeBron was because he wasn't following the same route as Jordan. And that that's supposed to be the definition of greatness. But the other component to that is what I just said. And I, and I firmly believe that. Uh, listen, you, you hit the nail on the head. And if you think about it, no one gives backlash to any championships that Larry Bird won, that Magic Johnson won, that Michael Jordan won. Michael Jordan played with other Hall of Famers. 
You know what I mean? Like, guys, you don't win championships without playing with other guys that are great, first of all. But it wasn't done in the way that LeBron did it, in the way that we did it. It was done from organizations. The organizations made sure that Larry Bird had Mikhail, Robert Parrish, Dennis Johnson. You know what I mean? Like, all these Hall of Famers. And it was, you know, so it was different. And and I agree with you, man. And we, we I didn't say that. I'm glad you said that. But we felt that way. We knew that some of the hate was because of our skin color, because of being black men and deciding to control the fate of our careers. Because I, because organizations will do it quickly. They will trade a Dwayne Wade in a heartbeat if you're not getting if you're not getting it if you're not accomplishing what they want you to accomplish. So when we had the power, when we had the moment, we took it. But some of the hate came because of we were three black guys who decided. And we changed the way that the NBA probably would ever be, right? Because of that decision. So I agree with you, man, 100%. I want to talk a little bit, before we get to our speed round and our draft, I want to talk a little bit about the social justice fund uh, that you and Mello and CP started recently. Uh, Tommy's involved with LeBron's uh, organization and initiative, More Than a Vote. Okay. Uh, can you just sort of talk about... Um, your goals, what your action plans are for this social justice fund that you guys just recently launched? Yeah, man. Um, you know, we, we were trying to think of some things to do together because we know that the strengths are in numbers, right? We know that, you know, our platforms together is more powerful than our platforms apart. And this issue, uh, this, this, this issue of not just racism, but uh, the issue that we've had in the black community uh, is a big issue to tackle. And it can't be tackled by one individual. So, you know, Carmelo, CP, and myself decided to get together to create the social change fund. And what what we what we knew what the best thing that we can do is we can use our platform and our reach and our relationships and our pocketbooks to support the people that are really doing the real work. So in our social change fund, the money is going to organizations that's on the ground that are doing the actual work. You know, we're we're guys who let's face it, Jay, like we, we don't have time to really be in it, in it, you know, like people who, this is their, this is what they do. They're on the front line. They're in these communities making this real change. So we want to make sure that they have everything they need to really continue to make that change. Um, so we started a social change fund to support these organizations, you know, um, in uh, black communities uh, to really create change in the things that we wanted to see. And we all had, a, a th we all had, um, certain things coming in in the beginning that hey this this is what we're this is what I would like to focus on you know CP wanted to focus on healthy eating you know Mello wanted to focus on police reform uh, so it was all these different things that we wanted to focus on we just put it together and we created a social change fund. It's amazing. Is there is there a website that uh, people can go to if interested? Yeah, yeah. The social uh, is uh, socialchangefund.org. Um, all right, Tommy. Let's get to the speed round. Why don't you start us off? Uh, Five or six questions. You can keep the answer short if All you right. want. All right, let's do it's it. Uh, Dwayne, who's the young player in the league right now that reminds you the most of yourself? Donovan Mitchell. Hmm. Donovan Mitchell. I like that. Undersized, underrated coming in. Um, plays kind of similar. I mean, he could shoot better than me, obviously, but plays very similar to uh, the way I play, how, you know, and this is a guy who I've, I've mentored, obviously. He, he realized that he plays similar to me and has reached out to me on multiple occasions. Uh, so I'll say Donovan Mitchell. You and I both played with uh, Jimmy Butler. We're both friends with Jimmy. Yeah. Why, why, why do you think he's so misunderstood? Because he's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Jimmy. He's Jimmy. And uh, I love him. But he's crazy. <laughs> I don't know if Jimmy's misunderstood. I just think that Jimmy's not what everyone expect an NBA player to be. Jimmy is he's been this way, I, I would assume, his entire life. He's not people just ain't, haven't taken time to understand that we're all different, Jay. You know what I mean? Like they like I said, it goes back to that. Hey, Michael Jordan did this way. LeBron has like we're all different. And Jimmy's style and the way that he moves is just different than yours. And you got to try to get to understand Jimmy Butler. If you take time to understand him, then you understand that you can use his craziness in so many positive ways that will make not only him greater, but make your team greater, your organization greater. But everyone don't take the time to really learn the players that come into their organizations. Um, so Jimmy is a special breed. 
Uh, and special I, guy, I, real special guy. He's special in so no, many ways. I, I think the players and his teammates that have taken the time to understand Jimmy love him. They love him. All right, next one, Tommy. Uh, funniest teammate you've ever played with? Eddie House. Ooh. Eddie House is one of the most – he's the, one of the funniest people. I think he missed his calling. And he was good at basketball, <laughs> but he could have been a great comedian. He, he, he was hilarious, man. Eddie House, yeah. Um, three titles. Besides those three titles, favorite moment of your career? One moment that stands out. Um, June 26, 2003, getting drafted. That was a – I never wanted to shake a man hand as bad as I wanted to shake. David Stern's hand. Uh, that was the moment that changed my, it really changed my entire life. Um, and I mean, I got so many great moments, Jay. Like I could pick so many from college and whatever, but getting drafted to the NBA, it just changed the course of, I, mean, I look at my kids, I'm looking at my daughter right now. Uh, it just changed the course of our life. And uh, I'll forever be grateful and thankful for that for that moment. I was really hoping that you would say the dunk on Bergeau, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, Bergeau, if you're out there listening, man, hit me on DM. So let's talk. Bergeau ain't talking to say dunk. I'm just doing my job, you know? Tommy, explain this week's draft. Okay. Wait, so we're drafting our favorite movie villains, and it's a snake draft. So obviously you pick somebody. We can't pick them. You pick first. I'm second. JJ's three, four, then back to me and back. Oh man, I'm. And it can be any kind any game. kind of movie, any kind of movie. Just the villain, favorite favorite villain from that movie. Listen, I like chick flicks, man. I who who are good villains? Oh, can, so do I? Do can y'all go first? Do I got to go first? Uh, we, JJ, you start. You can do and you can do TV too I'll if you choose, want. Then it could get like my mind yeah. going. Like okay, yeah, all right. you can do TV if you want to. All right. I don't think I don't. Th it sounds to me like D Way is not going to win this one because. I've got a whole draft board. I know Tommy came with the draft board. All right, I'll go first. I'll go first this Ooh, week. I, nor I normally Ooh. go third. All right, uh, first pick. I'm going to go with Anton Chigurh from uh, No Country for Old Men, Javier Bordem's character. That's a good one. I was thinking about it. it's a dark movie, but it's a good pick. He's a good villain. Yeah, he's one, right, it's I'm, one of my favorite I'm movies up, too. I'm yeah. going. I'm going. Uh, Alonzo Training Day. Oh. That's my number oh, okay. one. Okay. Okay. How about um, I don't know if it's my favorite because I ain't prepared, but I'm now y'all got me thinking. How about uh, what about Hannibal Lecter? Is that a is that a good movie? It's a great one. That's a good one. That, that counts. A great one. That's a All that's right. a good number one pick. Okay. So you get you have another one now. <sighs> the Joker. Um. Uh. The the the, the good Joker. Heath Ledger. Heath, Heath Ledger. Ledger. Heath Ledger. Sorry. Yeah. Those are two good picks. That's a two that's great a, picks. Okay. That's oh, a, great two pass. are two great picks. All yeah. right. I'm throwing a curveball for my second one. Scar, Lion King. <laughs> what the fuck? It's a movie. <laughs> that was unexpected. I'm not going to lie. Hilarious, by the way. That's a great pick. I love it. I actually thought about drafting um, Lotso from Toy Story 3 because my kids loved the first two tour stories and they could not get through the third one without crying because he's so terrifying in that movie. All right. I get two picks. Mm. I'm going to go with, this is a fucking, I mean, I can't believe this guy's still on the board. I'm going to go with Thanos and agent Smith from the matrix agent movies. Smith from the matrix. Oh, that's a good one. It's <laughs> a good one. Those good are two, one. those are two good picks. All right. My third, uh, Cyrus, the virus from con air. Ooh, no. I'm not familiar. Oh, I gotta check you that should, out. Next movie night. I gotta check that out. Con Air, you need to watch. Uh, so it's my turn. So JJ kind of sparked this in me because he said it. Fear, Freddy Cougar. I couldn't sleep at night. Yeah, <laughs> solid. Know, Freddy Cougar. That's Freddy Cougar. Solid. Yeah. That's so you great. got another one. I got another one. So let's stay on that same path. And I know I'm not. I'm not. And and. I got to think of some black movies because I'm really on. I ain't on no black movies right now, so I got to think of some black movies. But right now, Michael Myers is my next one. Is in that same, that same genre. That works. <laughs> there you go. I mean, these are these are great choices. <laughs> like, I'm like I got I got to think of something. But yeah, Michael Myers. There you go. D Wade showed up to a pop, he showed up to a pop quiz unprepared, and he's and he's got a hundred so far. By the way, <laughs> so by, by the way, we're gonna put this. We always put this online after we air the episode, and you're gonna win. Everyone's yeah. gonna agree with you. They gonna agree with me? Fuck. You're gonna you're gonna win this thing having not prepped. 
All right, my fourth one is a definitely a curveball. Uh, Mugatu from Zoolander. Wow. I definitely wow. <laughs> I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you. The way this is headed, you're going to fucking lose this draft. People are going to kill your choices online. These are terrible. Terrible. All right. He's a great character. <laughs> I've got two left. All right. Uh, I'm going to go with Kaiser Soze from The Usual Suspects. And uh, have you, either of you seen The Raid? It's an Indonesian action movie. I've seen The Raid. I've seen right. The Raid. Mad Dog. The, from the, the psych, Raid? From The Raid. Mad Dog. Yep. Okay. I'm closing it out. Yep. We'll close it. I don't think... I'm, I'm, I, no, I have it. Then you got your fifth. I'm going in your fifth. Oh, okay. I don't think you guys are going to like this one. Dr. Evil. Oh, Austin geez. Powers. <laughs> Jeez. Babe. Hey. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to use a lifeline. Babe, can you give me your favorite villain in movies? Who's your favorite villain? Oh, Chacha de Gregorio, the best dancer at St. Bernadette, with the worst reputation. Grease reference. Grease. Okay, so she said Grease, uh, Chacha de Gregorio. The best dancer. That's a good pick. That's Thank actually you. a great pick. Bernard that's a Grease. great pick. That was my wife, so that would be my last pick. All right, that's a great pick. I think we're all going to get killed because no one picked Darth Vader. But oh, I was um, list. I was going to say Darth Vader. I was, but <laughs> honorable mention. <laughs> yeah, we'll give him an honorable mention. Yeah, no, I just you. Yeah, but no, that was a good one. That was good because it was unexpected. All right, yeah, that was great, D Wade. Thank, thank you for the time, man. Appreciate the insight, yeah, the stories. Awesome. Uh, you're, you're awesome on TV. Uh, so keep, keep, uh, keep doing that, and and best of luck to everything you got going on, man. No, thank you, man. Like I said, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I'm a big fan of you guys, uh, y'all questions and how y'all, it's just, it's different. And so uh, thank you for having me on, man. Keep doing what y'all doing. I'm going to keep listening and I'm going to keep telling other people to listen because what y'all doing is great. So keep All right. Going. Thanks, man. Thank you, brother. All right, brother.